And over these cable car rails, we begin our journey into yesterday. It is a time of beginnings. The day of the automobile has just dawned, and their proud owners drive them erratically, sputteringly, and enthusiastically in our path. Towering in the distance stands the newly built ferry building, terminus for the many busy ferry boats plying the waters of San Francisco Bay. The horse was king outnumbering the gasoline buggies by a whopping 1,000 to 1. A sleeping giant called electricity is stirring in unrest, and a streetcar, powered by that invisible force, crosses our path. Nearly everyone thought that neither electricity or the automobile could ever replace the horse. To be sure, even the cable car could not replace the horse car. There goes one of them now, clip-flopping its way up Market Street and on toward history and oblivion. A last glimpse of a busy city as the fateful day in 1906 approach. Earthquake and fire leveled most of the city, and the whole world was stunned. As we ride down Market Street on an electric car, it is through a city in ruin. Gaunt iron skeletons surround us. Debris is piled high. Its citizens plot along. And the sight of the ferry building, still standing unscathed, seems a beacon of hope and a promise of a better tomorrow. Today, a half century later, we pause on Market Street for a last look at the ferry building. Now, just a symbol. It is our final privilege to take the last ferry boat to depart, for they too are now a part of the past, another memory. From the deck, a panorama unfolds, for the San Francisco of our age is one of beauty. A mighty auto freeway cuts across our path, as if to bar us from our return to yesterday. The bridge under which we sail is the giant that doomed the picturesque ferries. At the Oakland Mall, we join other travelers and once more find our magic rails and a new friend. The mighty diesel-hauled train, undisputed monarch of rail travel, ready to speed us over the many miles to yesterday. is our magic carpet. Reversing the steps of the pioneers, we move eastward and enter the Feather River Canyon to take the long climb over the Sierra Nevada Mountains. This area is just as rugged and challenging as it was in the days of 49, yet gliding along smoothly in comfort it is just the beauty that we encounter. In the heart of these rugged mountains at Quincy, California, we are met in salute by one of the last of the old-time short-line railroads. Friends have gathered, for this is the last time that old number eight will meet the main line train, for it has reached journey's end. Yet it has come to that end over its entire six miles of track with great dignity. As we glide by, the blast of its steam whistle fills the air, and its bell tolls out no notes of sadness, but a farewell filled with joy to speed us on our way to those yesterdays that lie over the far horizon. As the miles unroll, we pass over the awesome deserts of Nevada, magnificent in their scope, with great white clouds overhead, holding only the promise of rain, a promise rarely fulfilled in this arid land. of steel enter Utah and a land of dazzling white 
For this is another type of desert, one of salt, extending for miles in every direction. It is here that a mirage may take the form of a mountain, city, or lake, and the reality and imagery joined forces to challenge the minds of the westward-moving pioneers. As salt desert melts into the waters of the Great Salt Lake, we pass a great inland sea with no outlet, 2,600 miles in area, with over 6 million tons of salt held in solution in its waters. On its shore is Salt Lake City, where the Mormon leader Brigham Young halted with his group of travelers in 1847. Temple Square, with its tabernacle and temple, dominate the city center. A monument marks the spot where he spoke. This is the place. In the mountains, just south of the city, the world's largest open pit mine, 2,160 feet in depth, which as a theater could seat over 9 million people. In its pit could be placed, side by side, the Yankee Stadium, the Rose Bowl, Cotton Bowl, Orange Bowl, Madison Square Garden, and leave room for several 5,000 car parking lots. Its giant terraces are ore levels, forming a magnificent pattern of graceful curves. Entering Colorado, we realize that a changing world has set aside some of the important things that built the West. For it was here that the far-off echo of the locomotive's whistle heralded the advance of civilization along the steel rails. It was inevitable that some of these paths were to crumble into dust. But first, they serve to carry untold numbers across our country. We have entered the domain of the narrow gauge, where at one time, the 14,000-foot mountains were laced with thousands of miles of rails and highways were unknown. Our guidepost here seems almost as a monument to a forgotten day, yet it beckons us to move over the hill where adventure waits. At Durango, Colorado, 10 coaches of the Denver and Rio Grande's Silverton stand on the last 50 miles of narrow gauge track in the United States. The railroad depot is jammed with hundreds of travelers from all over the world, not to seek uranium or silver or gold, but just to buy the ticket that will carry them into yesterday. A busy agent faces a growing crowd, and the 400 seats are soon sold out, a daily occurrence. The train is jammed to its ease, yet more and more climb aboard. An eight-foot-long ticket holds up loading for a moment as the conductor searches for the right coupon. It's only outdated by 87 years, but it's surely good for one more ride. We start the last leg of our journey, leaving behind some disappointed travelers, but Tomorrow is another day for them. Today is yesterday for us. Leaving Durango in the morning sunlight, the little engine seems eager for the job, climbing the almost three-mile peaks of the mountain range ahead. First comes breakfast aboard the Silverton, and every car is a diner. The friendly conductor and his brakeman act as co-hosts. The service is speedy and unique. Railroad coffee and donuts for old and young. Underway with the locomotive puffing along, the roadbed is hidden by undergrowth and trees. finds groups of people who couldn't get aboard but cheer us onward. Approaching the canyon of the Las Animas River, River of Lost Souls, the rails cling to the side of a rocky cliff with a sheer drop to the river beneath. Inside the train, everyone rushes to the window for a better view. But some couples find time for romance and books. 
Air conditioning on the Silverton is automatic, for every window and door is left wide open, and the nostalgic and pleasant aroma that can only come from a coal-burning steam engine adds pleasure. Even the bare necessities of life get an assist from the conductor. deeper and higher and higher with a rock and roll beat we chug into the high country the surrounding peaks soar to over 14,000 feet within the locomotive cab the fireman works constantly as coal must be shoveled by hand into the roaring firebox each shovelful gives forth a belch of black smoke a tribute to a tireless coal heaver steam must be kept high for the climb is ever upward Second only to its appetite is the ravenous thirst of the little engine, and it is thus that we approach a stop, one that has completely vanished from American railroading, the water stop. For almost a century, these water tanks were landmarks across the United States. The fireman reaches the water tender and lowers the spout. Cool mountain water pours in and spills over. into the firebox and we climb our last few miles through the mountains for yesterday is just around the next bend we enter a setting of fantastic beauty silverton colorado an unspoiled jewel in its fantastic setting linked to the present by the last of the narrow gauge rails train halts, the 400 passengers eagerly climb out. This is the yesterday that they have sought. Time has been kind, and the crisp mountain air has seemingly arrested the ravages of age, for the buildings of Silverton are authentic and genuine. Suddenly, Silverton comes to life, and a lively life indeed, for in moments, notorious Blair Street is full of blazing action. A gun battle starts in front of the bent elbow, and miners and mules scurry to safety. The whine of bullets fills the air. A desperado on the balcony is a target for the gunman below. But first, he takes mortal toll before he slumps over the rail. The street is littered with dead in a matter of seconds, and the coroner goes about measuring the deceased for a fitting burial. As peace is restored, the visitors breathe easily once more and gaze in wonder at these relics of the past. The Bon Ton Garter Shop features an outdoor fitting by the proprietor, displaying the newest in ladies' corsets. A wedding at the church, complete with shotgun. Grand Imperial Hotel still lives up to its name in luxurious splendor and is still the meeting place for the polite and elite of mountain society. The doings of Silverton are still chronicled in their daily newspaper, as they have been for over 75 years. What stories of a great and glorious past lies buried in these yellowing files? The trivial and the important dying together yesterday and today. The county courthouse holds the secrets of many men, of failures, of success, of justice, of violence. Meanwhile, back on Blair Street, life goes on, but not without problems. It appears that the Chinese laundryman needs a modern hearing aid. A few steps away, all is quiet at the Rocky Mountain Stage Depot, but watch closely, villainy is afoot, 
Before you can take a deep breath, a robbery gets underway. The sheriff and posse arrive. Two men are shot. Two captured. The money and strong box rescued. Mighty fast work, even out west. What irony. The stolen money just out of reach of the dead man's hand. And what nonchalance. A corpse that winks. Huddled together for safety, the visitors photograph every suspenseful moment. Wait a minute. That stage depot robber wasn't dead, just slightly dying. So the posse drags him up to the Silverton jail, and there behind iron bars in a scene of moving realism, he passes into the great beyond, just as he does every day about the same time. The strong, silent men of Silverton nail down the wooden sidewalks before anyone tries to steal them as well. In the peaks that surround Silverton, untold wealth lies hidden. The mines that once produced gold, silver, and lead are deserted. But the ore is still buried deep, awaiting a newer day. As day's end draws near, the tiny locomotive with its string of coaches moves slowly out of Silverton along those magic rails that carried us back to yesterday. Each coach filled with passengers and memories of the past. The lonely echo of the locomotive whistle is carried back through the canyons. A deep-throated promise to return on another tomorrow. Tomorrow.